as the last as the last Prime Minister's question before recess, I know the whole House will want to join me in wishing you and all the House staff a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And I know members will also want to join me in sending our warmest wishes to our armed forces, both at home and stationed overseas, and our emergency services, and all those who will be working over Christmas too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And finally, I know everyone will want to join me in wishing Mark Drakeford all the best yeah, as he moves yeah, yeah, yeah. on from his many, many years of devoted public service. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Can I concur with the comments of the Prime Minister about our armed forces, Christmas and Mark Drayford? My constituent, Mr Speaker, um, Fred Bates, is 74, he has liver cancer and he's a victim of the contaminated blood products scandal. The Prime Minister had a chance to do right by Fred last week, but failed to do so and lost the vote in this House. After half a century, Fred wishes to know when he and fellow survivors will be compensated and get justice. Yeah. Now, Mr Speaker, this was an appalling tragedy, and my thoughts remain with all those concerned. I absolutely understand the strength of feeling on this. It was government previously who set up the inquiry, which I participated in, and we fully understand the need for action. The government has crucially already accepted the moral case for compensation and acknowledged that justice does need to be delivered for the victims. My right hon. Friend, the Minister for the Cabinet Office, will update the House on our next steps on the infected blood inquiry shortly. Rex Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The tax cuts in the autumn statement were extremely welcome. Yeah. 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 But in order to go further and to get the tax burden as low as it possibly can be, accurate and robust economic modelling is required. The Office of Budget Responsibility have been habitually wrong, and we had the spectacle last week of the head of the OBR saying that his latest forecast might be £30 billion out. So will my right honourable friend commit to finding a better system of financial modelling so we can get taxes lower? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, as my honourable friend knows, uh, the OBR has brought greater transparency and independence to the forecast in which government policy is based. But it, he's right, and it is required to produce an assessment of its accuracy of its fiscal and economic forecasts at least once a year. But crucially, as he acknowledged, thanks to our management of the economy, the fact that we have halved inflation, control borrowing, we now have delivered the largest tax cuts in a generation, Mr Speaker, and they will benefit families up and down the country from January. Okay, the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yesterday we heard of the tragic death of a young man on the Bibby Stockholm. I know the whole House will want to send our deepest condolences to his family and friends. We must never let this happen again. I would also like to mark the retirement of my colleague and friend, Mark Drakeford, the First Minister of Wales. Mark committed his life to public service and lives his values every day. Quietly and patiently, Mark has been a titan of Labour and Welsh politics, and we thank him for his service and wish him well. Mr Speaker, Christmas is a time of peace on earth and goodwill to all. Has anyone told the Tory party? Mr Speaker, Christmas, Mr Speaker, Christmas is also a time for families, and under the Conservatives we do have a record number of them, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, but it's important. A year, at the beginning of the year, I set out some priorities that this government would deliver for the British people. And over the course of this year, we have, Mr. Speaker, inflation halved, Mr. Speaker, the economy growing, debt falling action on the longest waiters, the boats down by a third, and crucially, as we heard from Honourable Friend, tax cuts coming to help working families in the new year. Mr Speaker, he can spin it all he likes, but the whole country can see that, yet again, the Tory party is in meltdown and everyone else is paying the price. Now, he's kicked the can, he kicked the can down the road, 
But in the last week, his, his MPs, his MPs, have said of him, he's not capable enough. He's inexperienced. He's arrogant. A, a really bad politician. Well, they're shouting. This is what they said. So, well, come on, come on. Who, who was it who said he's a really bad politician? Hands up. <laughs> What about inexperienced? Who was that? <laughs> or and now there's got to be some hands for this. He's got to go. Yeah. Oh, shy. Yeah. Apparently, he's holding a Christmas party next week. Ha Order. Order. It's Christmas. No, the. Cri yeah, 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 but you yeah, might yeah. not want the Christmas present that I could give you. So please, oh. yes, Lama. Apparently, he's holding a Christmas party next week. How's the invite list looking? <laughs> Mr. <laughs> uh, Mr Speaker, I, uh, I, I, I thank the uh, honourable gentleman for all the comments. Uh, what I would say to him, he should hear, he should hear, I, I th he should hear what they have to say about him, Mr yeah. Speaker. Right. Do you want to be the first one? Because it is Christmas and I'm going to hear it. My constituents are going to have a Christmas like everyone else. They want to know how their Christmas is going to be affected. So I want less of it from all sides. Keir Starmer. They've obviously found the donkey for their nativity. The search, the search of three wise men may take a little longer. Uh, but while they fight amongst themselves, there's a country out here that isn't being governed. Where more than 100,000 people are paying hundreds more a month on their mortgages. Yeah. Energy bills going back up in January. The economy shrinking again. NHS waiting lists an all time high. Doesn't he think the government would be better off fixing the messes they've already made rather than scrambling to create new ones? Yeah. Well, Mr. 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 Speaker, he talks about governing and spent the first two questions talking about political tittle tattle, yeah. Mr. Speaker. Well, let's get on to the substance, Mr Speaker. Let's get on to the substance. He mentioned the things. What is the news that we've just heard in the last week? Well, what's the most important thing? The most important thing is education, Mr Speaker, because that's how we spread opportunity in our country. And what have we yeah. learned? Where are the schools performing best in the United Kingdom? In England, Mr Speaker, thanks to the reforms of this Conservative government, rising up the league tables, giving our kids the start they need. And where are they plummeting down? In Labour-run Wales. He, he talks about children. Nearly 140,000 children are going to be homeless this Christmas. That is more than ever before. That's a shocking state of affairs, and it should shame this government. Instead of more social housing, house building is set to collapse. Instead of banning no-fault evictions, thousands of families are at risk of homelessness. Rather than indulging his backbenchers swanning around in their factions and their star chambers pretending to be members of the Mafia, when's he going to get a grip and focus on the country? Yeah. Yeah. Let's just look at the facts. Let's look at the facts, actually, because rough sleeping, rough, rough sleeping in this country is down by 35%, Mr Speaker, since it speaks, thanks to the efforts of this government. There are hundreds of thousands of fewer children in poverty today, thanks to this government, Mr Speaker. And when it comes to home building, again, what are you doing? We just had the data this last week. In the last year, an almost record number of new homes delivered, Mr Speaker, more than in any year of the last Labour government. 140,000 children homeless this Christmas, and he's utterly tone deaf. Yes. And the rise in homelessness shows how these Tory crises merge and grow and damage the country. Yes. Families like the Bradys in Wiltshire, both parents working full time with two young children, forced out of their home of 15 years by a no fault eviction, now living in their van. Or 11 year old Liam Walker, homeless this Christmas. He wrote a letter to Santa saying, please can I have a forever home? I don't want any new toys, I just want all my old toys out of storage. I just want us to be happy again. Is there anything 
that could shame this government into putting the country first, then it's surely this little boy. Yeah. Mr Speaker, if he really cared about building homes... No, 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 no. If he really cared about building homes, when, when there was an opportunity in this House, Mr Speaker, in this House to back our plans to reform defective EU laws, to unlock 100,000 new homes, Mr Speaker. What did he do? What did he do? He went in front of the cameras and said one thing and came in here and blocked it. Typical, shameless opportunism. Thank you, Mr Speaker. He hasn't finished. Has the world changed? One more. Mr Speaker, is that really his Christmas message to Liam? Cocoons in his party management breakfast. He just can't see the country. Order, order. Mr Cleverley, please. It's Christmas. I want a little bit of silence. And I'm, I'm going to get it one way or another. And that goes to each side. Here's Starmer. Cocooned in his party management breakfast, he just can't see the country in front of him and what they've done. I'll finish by thanking hard-working families across Britain who kept our country going. It's been an impossibly difficult year for so many. I want to pay special tribute to our key workers, particularly those in the emergency services and those serving abroad in our forces, who, even at this time of year, are doing the vital work of protecting their country. I wish everyone, including the members opposite, a very happy and peaceful New Year. Will the Prime Minister join me? Prime Minister. I think, I think, I think Mr Speaker, he, mi he, missed, he, mi he missed that I paid tribute to our emergency workers at the beginning of the session, Mr Speaker. But let's see, no, because I think it is important, because he talked about working families. Of course, Mr Speaker, I want to make sure that we support working families, and that's what we're actually delivering, Mr Speaker, because all he has to offer them is borrowing £28 billion a year which all it will do is push up their mortgage rates and push up their taxes. Meanwhile, what have we done? Delivered tax cuts for millions of working families, boosted the national living wage, Mr Speaker, recruited 50,000 more nurses, 20,000 more police officers, improved our schools. We've cut the cost of net zero for those working families. We've cut the boat crossings by a third and we've halved inflation. And that's the difference, Mr Speaker. We're getting on and delivering for working Britain. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the world struggles to agree the future of the 1.5 commitment, in Wimbledon we're keen to do our bit. So, to help my campaign to make EV charging access more widespread, can I ask my right honourable friend for two early Christmas presents? Will you speak to our right honourable friend, the Chancellor, to ask him to look again at the unfair differential rates of VAT on public and private? charging points, yeah, yeah. and will he ask our friend, <coughs> our right honourable friend, the Levelling Up Secretary, to look at the bylaws that stop local councils making on-street parking and charging more accessible? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, I'm happy to tell my honourable friend that the Chancellor has already uh, authorised over £2 billion of investment to support our transition to zero emission, emission vehicles, and we are well on track to reach 300,000 charge points by 2030. And I can also tell him that we will consult on amending the National Planning Policy Framework to make sure that it prioritises the rollout of charge points, on top of the funding of almost £400 million to support local authorities spread these out so all our families have access to them when they need. SNP Leader Stephen Flynn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can the Prime Minister please share his Christmas message for children being bombed in Gaza this winter? Yeah, yeah. Prime Minister. No. No, nobody wants to see this conflict go on for a moment longer than necessary. We urgently need more humanitarian pauses to get all the hostages out and to get life saving aid to Gaza to the of the Palestinian people. And we have been consistent that we support what is a sustainable ceasefire, which means Hamas must stop launching rockets into Israel and release all the hostages. Mr Speaker, if the current actions of the Israeli government continue, then it is, it is estimated that almost 1,400 more children will die between now and Christmas Day. Now, in the United Nations last night, our friends and allies in France 
in Ireland, in Canada, in Spain and in Australia. They joined with 148 other nations to vote with courage, care and compassion for a ceasefire. The UK, they shamefully abstained. How can the Prime Minister possibly explain why 153 nations are wrong, yet Westminster is right? Mr Speaker, as I have said consistently, we are deeply concerned about the devastating impact of the fighting in Gaza on the civilian population. Too many people have lost their lives already, and this is something that we have stressed and I have stressed personally to Prime Minister Netanyahu just last week. And what we are doing practically is to get more aid into Gaza, Mr Speaker. The Foreign Secretary is appointing a UK humanitarian coordinator, and in my conversations last week with Prime Minister Netanyahu, I pressed him on opening up the Karem Shalom crossing so that more aid can flow in, and we are actively exploring the opportunity for maritime corridors, something that the UK is well placed to lead, and I can give him my assurance that we will work night and day to get more aid to those who desperately need it. Dr Neil Hudson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We expect our young folk to remain in educational training until they are 18, but many lack transport to get there. With the amazing head teacher of Alston Moor Federation, Jill Jackson, I secured funding from the Council to get her students to college and pressed the Council for a half million pound bursary scheme to extend youth travel more widely. But we shouldn't have to do this. To secure equality of opportunity and true levelling up, will the Prime Minister look to mandate and support councils? to provide post-16 transport so all our young people in towns, cities and rural areas can reach their next stage in life. My uh, my honourable friend and the head teacher of uh, Alston Moore Federation, Jill Jackson, have done a fantastic job in securing more funding, and I wish her well also, I believe, on her upcoming retirement. As he knows, our, our school travel policy ensures that no child is prevented from accessing education by a lack of transport. Not only do we have home to school travel policies, but the 16 to 19 bursary fund can be used to support young people with transport costs and, more generally, we are taking action to keep bus fares capped at two pounds, Mr Speaker, but I will happily uh, make sure that the my honourable friend gets a meeting with the relevant minister to discuss his proposals further. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister will be aware of unionist concerns about uh, the need to remove the Irish Sea border created by the protocol, and that disrupts the UK's internal market. Will the Prime Minister bring forward legislation to amend the UK Internal Market Act and both guarantee and future-proof Northern Ireland's unfettered access to the UK's internal market in all scenarios? Can I thank my right hon. Friend? Uh, I recognise the need to do more in this area, and I can confirm to him that the Government does stand ready to legislate to protect Northern Ireland's integral place in the United Kingdom and the UK internal market, alongside an agreement to restore the executive. We can do this at pace, and I know my right hon. Friend and his colleagues are working hard to achieve that. Our NHS, our police officers and the most vulnerable in Northern Ireland need devolved government urgently, and I think it is incumbent on all of us to work day and night to help achieve that. Mr Luke Evans. 121 MPs from across the House signed my open letter to supermarkets asking to have a Buy British button online. I am pleased to announce that last week Morrisons were the first supermarket to implement a Buy British tab. That gives consumers the choice to have homegrown produce and also supports our farmers. So will the Prime Minister join my calls to ask other supermarkets to have the courage to make the change and follow suit? Well, Mr Speaker, this Government will always back our farmers, and I welcome the work of my honourable friend and the National Farmers Union on this particular issue. Uh, we absolutely support calls for industry-led action on this topic. I welcome the news about the Buy British Button, uh, Buy British Button at Morrison's, uh, and I can tell my honourable friend that we will continue to encourage all retailers to do all they can to showcase the incredible food produced right here in the United Kingdom. Stephen Timms. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the marriage plans of thousands of couples were dashed last week by the sudden announcement of a big increase in the salary requirement for a spouse visa. Can the Prime Minister give any reassurance to those with very well advanced 
marriage plans which appear now to have been scuppered, and to families already in the UK who need to extend their stay who won't comply with the new rules. Can he at least offer some transitional help for families, or does his party's support for the family now only apply to the highly paid? Well, Mr Speaker, we have a long-standing principle that anyone bringing dependents to the UK must be able to support them financially. We should not expect this to be at the taxpayers' expense, and the threshold hasn't been raised in over a decade. It's right that we have now brought it in line with the median salary. Uh, the family immigration route, as he knows, does contain provision for exceptional circumstances, but more generally, it's also right, and I can tell him, to look at transitional arrangements to ensure that they are fair, and the Home Office are are actively looking at this and will set out further information shortly. Well, in Thank yeah. you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Yeah. And I make no apology for raising once again the issue of steel. As yeah. You know, yeah. We are at serious risk now of losing the ability to make virgin steel here in the UK. I know the government are working hard on this, but it is a matter of national security and we need the Prime Minister's leadership on this issue. What is he doing to ensure that we are able to make our own virgin steel and we don't lose it under his watch? Uh, Mr Speaker, can I praise my honourable friend's leadership for championing her local community but also the steel industry in the UK? And she's right to do so because it is an incredibly important part not just of our local communities but of our economy and security and she is right to put this issue on the agenda. We are committed to working with the steel sector to secure a decarbonised future, supporting local economic growth and our levelling up agenda. That includes our commitment for major support with energy costs but also access to hundreds of million pounds of grants to support energy efficiency and decarbonisation. I obviously can't comment on conversations with individual companies, but she can see our track record in working with either Celsa or Tata Steel that we have been able to support our fantastic steel industry and will always continue to do so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Thank you, Mr Speaker. A rogue company has walked away from 13,000 tonnes of hazardous waste in Lancaster and it's now been on fire for 10 days. There are plumes of smoke covering our city. Lancaster City Council has been left to pick up the tab and to date they've spent £262,000. Without government support and intervention this fire will burn for several months. So will the Prime Minister support my local council with swift government support? Yeah. Yeah. Can I thank the Honourable Member for raising this incredibly important question? I know she's been working alongside my Honourable Friend, the Member for Morecambe, on this. Um, and can I also thank the emergency services in her constituency? And my understanding is that Lancaster City Council, the Environment Agency, and the UK HSA and emergency services are working together to ensure that the health risks and environmental consequences are minimised. But I will uh, ensure that the relevant minister understands the absolute urgency of the issue that she's raised, and I'll make sure that she meets with them as soon as possible. Jerome May. Mr Speaker, some dental practices are taking advantage of post-COVID demand to take their <coughs> NHS practices private, earning more money but leaving behind those most in need. Training a dentist costs constituents in Broadland more than £300,000. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that if a dentist accepts public funding in order to qualify, they should be asked to commit to NHS dentistry for a number of years Absolutely. before going private? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend makes an excellent point, and we are investing £3 billion into dentistry. The dentistry contract with the NHS was reformed last year to improve access for patients, uh, and over or around half of all treatment were delivered to non-paying adults and children. The number of adults is seen has gone up by 10 per cent, the number of children by 15 per cent. But my honourable friend is right, and more needs to be done, and that's why the government will be bringing forward the dentistry recovery plan in due course. I should have called over. Thank you, Mr Speaker. There are 12, day 12 days until Christmas, and hundreds of families in Battersea will be worried. Not about being able to buy gifts for children, but whether they can afford food and heat for their homes due to the Tories' cost of living crisis. Yeah. Over 4,300 emergency food supplies were provided in Battersea by the Wandsworth Food Bank this year, 
and they have told me that they are bracing for the worst winter yet. Yeah. So what is the Prime Minister doing to ensure families do not go cold and hungry this Christmas? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, we care deeply about making sure those who are most vulnerable in our society get the support that they need through the winter. That's why we increased welfare by record amounts earlier this year. We supplemented that with cost of living payments of £900 for the most vulnerable. It's why we supported those with energy bills who need our help the most. Pensioners in her constituency and elsewhere will receive up to £300 alongside their winter fuel payment. Uh, and indeed, that support lasts not just through the winter but into next year because we're deeply committed to helping those who need it. And this government has got a track record of delivering that help. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister is rightly focused on taking long term decisions to improve the lives of people in this country. So, can I make a suggestion? Our mental health legislation is 40 years old, and we made a manifesto commitment in 2017 and 2019 to reform the Mental Health Act because we have people with learning disabilities and autism sectioned under the Act being kept an inappropriate accommodation for long periods. We have people sectioned under that Act not receiving the compassionate care that they deserve and, in a sense, are criminalised. And we have people sectioned under that Act who um, are, have their mental health condition re-stigmatised by the Act of sectioning. So, would the Prime Minister, in the absence of a bill in the King's speech, would the Prime Minister agree to meet with me and other like-minded colleagues to discuss how we might be able to take forward reform of the Mental Health Act because it simply isn't fit for the 21st century? Yeah, 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 yeah. Minister. Well, can I thank my honourable friend for raising this important issue? Um, he's absolutely right uh, about the work that needs to be done, and I'm grateful to the Joint Committee on the Draft Mental Health Bill. And our intention is, uh, when parliamentary time allows, to bring forward uh, a bill. I'd be happy to meet with him and colleagues to discuss this, uh, but also just remind everyone that we are undertaking the largest expansion of mental health services in a generation, £2.3 billion of extra funding by March of next year, increasing capital investment in mental health urgent care centres and, under the long-term workforce plan, the largest expansion of the mental health workforce that we have ever seen in this country. Speller. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Rather than the headline chaos of his, a government that is dominating the media, much more important to the public, business and organisations is their deeply unsatisfactory day-to-day -day experience in engaging with this dysfunctional administration. As far as they can see, Britain isn't working. When's he going to get a grip? Mr Speaker, the most pressing issue facing families is the cost of living, which is why this government has delivered what it said, which was to halve inflation. Mr. Speaker. Not just that, we are supplementing that with significant tax cuts, benefiting working families from January, £450 for a typical person in work, demonstrating that we are absolutely on the side of hard-working families, and this government is cutting their taxes. Yeah. Mr Speaker, breast cancer survival rates have improved, but we need to go further on harder to reach cancers. There is a drop-in in Parliament this afternoon on lobular breast cancer and the research we need. Could my right honourable friend or his excellent new Secretary of State for Health find time in their busy chart diaries to join us? Well, can I thank my right honourable friend for the work that he does on this specific and important issue? Uh, I'm happy to tell him the Health Secretary, I believe, is attending this afternoon's event to hear more about its work. And I can assure him that we're focused on fighting cancer on all fronts prevention, diagnosis, treatment, research, and funding. We are making good progress, but there's always more we can do. And I look forward to hearing from him after this afternoon's event. Thank you, Mr Speaker. While Home Secretary was in Rwanda signing his new treaty, his department put out a contract to manage small boat arrivals until 2030 at a £700 million cost to the taxpayer. Doesn't this show that even the Home Office doesn't think the Minister's plan will work? No, I said, uh, total mischaracterisation, Mr Speaker, uh, of what was put out, which was an advert, uh, not a commitment. But what I can say to the Honourable Lady, I'm, I'm glad that she now cares about this issue, not something that we've seen previously from the side opposite, but our track record is clear. 
We have got the numbers of small boat arrivals down this year by over a third, Mr Speaker. That is what we are doing about it, the party opposite voting against every measure that we have taken. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I chair the caucus of 38 Conservative members of Parliament who have Britain's longest river flowing through their constituencies, and we have presented the business case to the Chancellor for £500 million to try to manage this river holistically. Our constituencies are now facing flooding every year with the damage that causes our businesses and our communities. And this evening I have an adjournment debate on flooding of the River Severn. Will the Prime Minister take an interest because the business case shows a GVA uplift for the West Midlands of over £100 billion if we can manage and tame Britain's longest river? Can I, uh, can I thank my honourable friend for raising this? I do recall he and I spoke about this when I was Chancellor, and I praise him for the work and his leadership on this issue in his local area. Uh, I will be ensure, I'll make sure the Chancellor does look at the business case, and he will know that we have a significantly inc- increased funding for flood defences to over £5 billion, protecting hundreds of thousands more homes. But if this is an interesting opportunity for the Chancellor to look at it, I'm sure he'll take that up. Christopher Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, what's worse? Uh, losing your WhatsApp messages as a tech bro, losing £11.8 billion to fraud as Chancellor, presiding over the biggest fall in living standards in our history, or desperately clinging on to power when you become even more unpopular than Boris Johnson? <laughs> Mr. Mr. Speaker, what matters to me is delivering for the British people, and that's exactly what we're doing. I don't Jim, Theresa Villiers. Theresa Villiers. Uh, given the appalling reports of sexual violence committed by Hamas on the 7th of October and the risk that hostages could be, have this treatment inflicted on them as well. Will he raise this issue in international fora so the international community demands strongly humanitarian access to hostages in Gaza? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Mr Speaker, the reports of sexual violence perpetrated by Hamas are deeply shocking. We have raised our concerns with the United Nations uh, a fortnight or so ago, and we are engaging with the Israeli government to consider what further support we can take. And more broadly, we continue to do everything that we can to ensure that all hostages can return safely to their families, including those British hostages and those with links to the UK. And she can rest assured that I and the Foreign Secretary are working tirelessly to bring about their safe return. That completes Prime Minister's questions.